Good day and welcome to the Strong Ambition Podcast. Today we're going to dive into mindset about training and nutrition with Dr. Lloyd Globerman. Dr. Globerman is a psychotherapist and we're going to discuss all the issues around psychology and how it's leading to the obesity epidemic. We talk about the problems that so many people have, especially around sleep, and we even dive into the problems of how this is affecting our youth and how the lack of sleep is really one of the major contributing factors to long-term obesity. We're also going to give you a lot of good handful of tools that you can use to actually consider when you're trying to improve your health and especially your habits around food. We also dive into his unique approach of using some hypnosis therapy in his own system that's making great behavior change for some of his clients. And he has a very unique story himself of how he actually fell into the profession that he's in now, but I'll let him tell that story. So without further ado, here's Dr. Lloyd Globerman. Good day, Lloyd. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Well, well, this is exciting. I'm, you know, really happy to meet you. I get an idea of your bio and it's it's super fascinating. You're in the realm of psychology, something I'm very passionate about. But let's dive into this and I want you to kind of tell your story more so to the audience. Um, tell them who you are, how you got into doing what you're doing now. Okay. Uh, let me back up now. Let me go back to yeah. when I was in college which is centuries ago. I, did, I graduated college in 1969. At that moment in time, I was a psychology major, okay? But that mm -hmm. doesn't mean anything to anybody. Everybody knows, hey, you have to pick a major. It was the first course I got an A in. So, okay, I am now a, a psychology major. My focus at that moment in time was a career in music. I was a drummer, taught myself how to play. I was in a band. We had some success. And it looked like maybe we could be able to get a record contract. All my focus was on that. All right. So we had an audition with the possibility of um, getting a record contract. And uh, while we were playing that set, I knew right then and there, three minutes in, my musical career was over. This was never going to happen. What I thought was going to be the next phase of my life. While I was doing it, I realized it was now over. And I'm thinking, what's next? What am I going to substitute for this, right? So with that now out of the way, because the band disbanded, it wasn't going to work. I walked down the street one day of a building that I had passed countless times before and paused and looked up and saw the name, Massachusetts Mental Health Center, right? This is while I'm trying to figure out, this is one week after I have graduated college. I am, <laughs> my wife to be and I were, were engaged. So this was a pivotal moment in my life and completely, totally confusing. So I said, I don't have a job. I need to get a job. Let me go in here. Okay, I go in, see a person at the desk. Could you please direct me to human resources? He says, down the hallway, second door on the left. Okay. I go down there, peek in, there's a woman at a typewriter. I said, uh, excuse me, are you uh, head of human resources? She says, uh, why? I said, uh, well, I was just wondering whether you had any job openings. And she said, uh, do you have a college degree? And I said, yes, I got my degree one week ago. She says, great, when can you start? I, and I paused. I said, excuse me, I must be missing something here. Uh, do you need to in interview me to find out what I, who I am and what I'm capable of? She said, no, you look pretty good. Let's do it. <laughs> so one week later, I am now on Service One, Massachusetts Mental Health Center, associated with Harvard, right? And I begin to be an attendant. It's a psychiatric aid. You do all the grunt work. You can imagine what it's like as an aide in a hospital. Three months after I start, a nurse pulls me over, one of the nurses that I've been working with. She says, I got to give you some feedback. And I think, oh, God, now what did I do wrong? She said, you're pretty good at this. Have you ever thought about having a career in mental health? And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, this is really weird. I get a job out of nowhere from somebody who doesn't know me at all. And this woman knows me for three months and is telling me, come into the business. I said, I didn't know what I was going to be doing at that moment in my life. So I went home, told my wife to be named. This is what the feedback I got. She said, okay, let's get you to apply to schools. So I got into a master's program at Cal State Los Angeles, 
went there while I was there. I applied to Syracuse, ended up there, got a doctorate in social psychology, moved to New York in 1976. And then slowly but surely, things evolved, including my interest in hypnosis, which Im impacted virtually everything that I have done since. And uh, here we are, how many years later? <laughs> <laughs> An awful lot of years. But it all started on a couple of quirky things that, for the most part, never happened to anybody. Right. Pure dumb luck. Here I am talking to you. I can't imagine that like, you're walking down the street and you look up like it's just th those kind of moments. And, you know, those moments happen all the time in our life where they don't lead anywhere. And then the one day it does, it's that pivotal, you know, sliding door moment that completely changes you for the better. Right. I do think, though, this is something about our psychology we underestimate. And it's where people will say things happen for a reason. But I, I really prefer the narrative we make a reason things happen. So, you know, there's something about your psychology possibly that, you know, you had a moment of resiliency that was searching every other day. You weren't searching for what that sign meant. And then for that moment, it meant something to you, right? No question. You, you bringing up resilience, incredibly important. You need to learn to how to deal with disappointment and failure in your life. If you can't, then nothing's ever going to happen because disappointment and failure are critically important for you to build that internal resource model that you need because nobody gets through life without disappointment, right? Absolutely. Rejection and failure has to happen because without it, you never get to that person who can cope, move on, and then have that good feeling. Yeah, it's no different. It's no different than like a hard workout, you know, and I just had a boxer recently where he was doing a sparring session and he got rattled and actually in the sparring session, he performed very well, but he was so rocked from it. And then I thought about kind of helping out, out through the next one. I'm like, no, you know what? He has to deal with this. He has to deal with being scared. He has to go into that ring, being nervous, having no one there. He came out of the other side angry and intense and ready to go for another fight. Like he came out with that resiliency and it was also, it, sometimes that breaks people down. They don't want to do it, but that showed him that he was capable of it. And it created that fire. It sparked him because if he would have gone in had a good sparring session, it was easy. He's not going to build it up enough to be prepared for the fight. Right? So that's that, that kind of perseverance you need to establish. What you're saying is singularly the most important lesson you can ever learn. Everything is built on that. So mm -hmm. that's it. What you told him, that, that's, and he'll, that's forever for him, what mm -hmm. transaction that you had. There are moments that stay with people forever. What you're with you and him, perfect. Yeah. It, and it's hard as a coach too, uh, when you're trying to, you know, walk someone through something, what's the appropriate time where it's like, I got to let you feel this. I have to, you, I have to be okay that you're not in a good state and you need to establish yourself in this state. I can't walk you through this. It has to be something where you're not feeling good. It's, it makes you angry for a day or two, but then your mind has this adaptive process. No different than my legs are really sore from that workout yesterday. Yeah, they're supposed to be. And so if you go <laughs> through, good. <laughs> yeah, that's a good leg workout. So if you go through a mentally challenging thing that, you know, leaves you with disappointment, any sort of emotional turmoil, your mind figures out a way to now problem solve that, to adapt to it, to become more resilient in that kind of a state. And I think, I think that's beautiful. That's why I find psychology so fascinating. What were some of the big things? I'm really curious from this because you came from the psychology degree and then you went into your master's. Um, what were some of the major things that you learned in the process of going through the master's? Was it more of like application, understanding clients and how to guide clients? Or what did you find from that? At, at that point in time, I was just becoming acquainted with the various things that were going on in the business. And it, it was a vital point in time. There was, there was um, Fritz Perls with Gestalt therapy and transactional analysis and Albert Ellis. There were so many different people, so many different themes that it was ready. For, so you read everything and try to figure out what's good and what's not good. Mm -hmm. And you get to a point when you realize, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> This was one of those enlightening moments for me. I don't remember exactly when, but the whole idea was the most important thing is not the therapy, but the therapist. Because for the most part, psychotherapy is two people talking. So it is the use of language. 
You might tell people to do different things because psychotherapy has different kinds of techniques. But the most important thing is the relationship that you've built with the person who's sitting opposite you, that they trust you, that what is about to happen is going to positively impact their emotional and behavioral life. That was something that took me a while to kind of grasp because everybody gets addicted to therapies, much like religions. They are psychological religions. So people can get really attached to stuff. You know, my religion is the religion. But when you can back up and realize so many things are exactly the same, it just looks different. Then you reach another kind of level and you can kind of then understand what's most important and apply it. Yeah, well, I think that's so important for people to value. Every trade has to have a good tradesman. You know, there's so many programs. You Again, I'll kind of use the analogy in, in training. Uh, you can use it in nutrition. Like if you don't have someone to apply it with you appropriately to the individual, it still can land flat on its face. And as you mentioned, it like it's 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 almost like the importance of like a surgeon because you're talking about the application is so important with the conversation, right? It's one thing if I write a program, I can be pretty, I can have a lot of assumptions with a squat and a push and a pull, like all these things that just the human body needs, but the individual psychology is so much more vulnerable and so much more fluid. That that conversation is so integral to the therapists themselves having the skill of like, okay, this is the right question. This is where we need to lead them. And that's why I've been so fascinated with psychology because it's so much more about the exploration with the individual and the, the conversation you can have without telling them the answer. Like that's not the key to them solving their problems. And, and, and I, that's why it's such an art form. Like it is, like you say, there's so many different school of thoughts that might guide you, but at the end of the day, you need to be able to put in reps and understand people and be very fluid in that moment to understand that not everyone's going to arrive at the same time. And there's different tools for different people from what I understand. And I'm really curious from your perspective, because uh, I try to understand this, the difference between psychology and like a psychologist versus a psychotherapist? What would be the inherent difference there? Well, a psychologist is one of a number of people, categories of people that can practice psychotherapy. So psychiatrists primarily dispense medications, but they can function as a therapist as well, or even independent of medication. Social workers, who focus on psychotherapy, can practice psychotherapy licensed in their individual states to do that. Nurses can be nurse practitioners of psychotherapy. So across the board, all of those categories and labels for people in the health profession, they can all be psychotherapists. Right. And and psychiatrists will have the ability to prescribe medicine and that's, that's inherently that's, that's correct, right. which may or may not be beneficial depending right. on who's prescribing and and the individual who's receiving the medication. Because yeah. I've seen it across the board from wow, that was really useful because it, it, it was the key to help the person right. use what occurs in therapy. And then I've seen people be made a mess of the different th- psychotherapies that have happened and changed and put them up and down and inside out and they don't know what's going on. So Right. And, and you're talking about the same thing there. The tradesman has to know what they're doing with the trade because it, it's such like a, it could be such a lazy problem for someone who might have all of the prerequisites of school and you're, uh, you're a licensed therapist, but then you're actually lazy and you're just like, yeah, let's just put this patch on it. Cause that's what it can be. It can be a patch for whatever the symptom is not knowing it has side effects or not being conscientious of the side effects it's going to have for the person down the road. And it wasn't the right tool at the time. And, and like, it's almost like, um, it, it should be like the last ditch effort, right? It should, shouldn't be like the, oh, the tool you pull out right away. It should be using more of the psychotherapy tools. And so that you're actually allowing the individual, but like you say, some people might just have that genetic component that we just need to do this one thing and okay, now they're calm. Now they're feeling in a better state. So when we look at more of uh, behavior change in general, I'm really curious about going into this because that's the, to me, the magic bullet, right? Is so many people are missing this within the, the current obesity epidemic. Um, what do you think people are really missing when it comes to behavior change? Most of the time, they're not paying as close attention to the movie that's playing in their head, which ends up generating certain kinds of feelings, which result in certain kinds of behaviors. Primarily because what happens inside our head is so omnipresent that it's invisible. 
is cognitive wallpaper. We hear stuff all the time and we pay no attention to it because it's there all the time. So if you can get people to slow down so that they can pay attention to whatever is looping inside of their head, then they can say, whoa, I didn't realize that that was actually happening. Hence, this is, we can change this thing now. We have an opportunity, we have some leverage to, to change. Paying attention to that internal stuff, critically important to, to making pe helping people change. Then they're just skill sets that people just have never practiced before because they never thought they could master them. When is it appropriate to be assertive? When is it appropriate that you're allowed to put yourself first? When can you say no? Singularly, the four most important words that we have in the in English language are yes, no, hello, and goodbye. When to say them is all of life. Thinking about it from the small things, moment to moment, like, should I really be eating this now when I'm not hungry? <laughs> Need I say more to that particular thing? To a more bigger ticket emotional issue. Is it is it worth my while to stay in this relationship now? Or is it time to say no, no more? Right? Yes, no, hello, goodbyes, but falls into the same category, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, no, hello, goodbye. You master those four words, you can live a functional, enjoyable life. Well, I, I totally agree. It it's this question that we give ourselves or really the the discussion of decision that actually should have already been decided, but we allow our emotions in the state to start driving us. And that's what I find so difficult for people to navigate, trying to give them a little bit of a mindset shift when I say if you're in the point of discussing something with yourself, you're negotiating with yourself on a decision like food, like whatever it is that you inherently know the answer to. But if you're trying to require justification to say yes to something, then that's probably the wrong answer because the right answer requires no justification. It's inherent to the decision. If the decision is, well, uh, yes, eat the carrots or no, don't eat this. Like, I don't even need to justify it. I know the answer. But if we're justifying this is our, our, our mind trying to rationalize our emotional state. You, you hit upon one of the key things. The self, come on. <laughs> okay. yeah. Please excuse my language, but the amount of bullshit that we run yeah. by ourselves and allow ourselves to be influenced by is, is vol voluminous. It's, it, we never stop. We are always going to do this a little bit, no matter how healthy we are. It's knowing that it's happening. And most of the time, people just fall into these loops because they appear so often that they're invisible. But once you get a, a sense of that, wait a minute, that's happening right now to me. I have a choice, and that's not a good thing for me to do right at this moment in time. Yeah. Yeah, the self-awareness. And I mean, just coming back to something you said initially, it's it's the stories that you're telling yourself that's going to dictate how you feel about your emotions, how you're going to feel about changing. And then that's, you're kind of getting into, uh, you know, kind of more being present with the moment when you're making decisions, right? You said you're trying to catch yourself out of your loops. And it's super important. That's what I really try to tell, explain to people is like, it's just a temporary loop. It's, it's just the way that your mind's used to running very intuitively. Uh, I want to say, which is why we don't always pay to need to pay to our attentions uh, or to our in, intuitions don't always lead us to our greatest uh, self because it's just your normal, um, you know, neurological pathway. Like you normally kind of do this behavior that doesn't make it like, just because it's natural to you doesn't mean it's great. And you want to catch yourself in it. It's like, hey, I didn't even think about reaching for those MMs. I just ate them again. I didn't even think about this and I just ate them again. And that's where we can interrupt that and be present with the moment. It's like, hey, you don't actually have to. It's just a feeling that this is where we can actually take control of the wheel, right? Absolutely. You hit upon singularly the most important behavior that anybody can learn. And it's ironic because the behavior that's most important is doing absolutely nothing mm. for five seconds and thinking about what you should be thinking about as a choice needs to be made, especially when it comes to emotional stuff. When you get revved up, everybody knows that reflexive emotional behavior where you, you're suddenly doing and saying things with, it, with an intensity that you realize this is not a good idea. But if you can learn to pause, it's the hardest skill to learn. I mean, just think about it. Doing nothing is singularly the most important thing you can discover. 
right? right? But you don't have to do it right all the time. Life is about most of the time. And if you give people that little bit of an opening to understand perfection never happens, and that occasionally all the things that you're, that you, that you're doing that aren't good are still going to be there, but much less, now they feel much more empowered. Like, I don't have to be perfect. And they can find out, well, I can actually pause this sometimes and get a different outcome. And then you get that self-esteem thing building, and now they feel differently, and everything shifts around in terms of internally talking to themselves and the relationships with other people. That should be the ultimate outcome of psychotherapy most of the time. All the time, nobody succeeds. Forget about it. Mm. You know, yeah. Even the great people in the business, right? When you look at some of their lives up close and personal, you go, uh-oh, what? Did, did I just hear a story about one of my heroes that's bizarre? Okay, <laughs> really. And there's a bunch of them out there. Like, like one, one great psychotherapist built his own therapy. Everybody knows who he is. I'm not going to mention any names right now. He was giving a birthday party for his wife, and she happened to be a pianist. And somebody asked her to play the piano during her birthday party. So everybody crowded around the piano while she was playing. And now he was getting no attention at all. He went into the corner and stood on his head. Now think about that for one second. <laughs> right, right away. You didn't expect that, did you? Like, no. I, I heard the story. Actually, I, I <laughs> was in a biography. And I said to myself, what? Oh, my goodness. Right, so we're all the same. Mm. That was liberating for me to realize that one of my heroes was that insecure. Like, oh my God, okay, now I understand this completely in a totally different way. Yeah, humans. I've got human. more power. Like, oh, for I sure. I have it, flaws, right? Now yeah. I can have flaws. Yeah. Well, and like you mentioned, it's this idea of power uh, because we feel like we are driven by these instincts. And so. I love that you simplify it because I've heard people, you know, say be mindful, but like the way that you just simplify it is like, it's a pause it's and you're very specific to the action, which is very important because people can say, be mindful. And that's such a general concept. It's still helpful because that's the goal of it. But if you just use the word, let's just pause more because if you pause, it's a simple action. It's like, instead of telling people be healthy, go for a walk. There's, there's a very specific thing you're doing. And in the moment that you normally want to take control of that, you normally feel out of control of pause, simple action. And then that gives a person an opportunity to realize, okay, what am I feeling in my body? What led me to this? Why is this normally my instinct? You start to recognize and scan things. And I mean, I always like to kind of pull analogies into things that people apply to like a sport and stuff like that. And when I have boxers or something like that, that are sparring and they're doing the same thing again and again, that's really wrong. And bear in mind, boxing is very emotional. Like it's very instinctual and it's very just rapid, rapid. And when I pause them, I'm like, Hey, this is what you're doing wrong. We're going to do it right five times in a row. And then it changes because now they've paused that behavior. They've analyzed what's wrong and they recreate a new instinct. I'd be curious from your perspective, Let's say, you know, we're talking about someone who's trying to control eating behaviors on that pause. What are some things, what are some reflections? What are some tools you give people to use in that moment? Well, the first thing I tell them to do is get up from where they're sitting because they're probably sitting down thinking about eating. Once you're in motion, it's much easier to change the conversation in your head. Okay. I, I like to, to play with numbers when I said, you know, how often do you do this? And they'll say, however, I don't know, four, five, six, whatever it is, we'll say, and you're not, never hungry about this, right? And you're eating this amount of food. I will give them sometimes numbers so they can reflect on exactly the effect of what they're doing over a period of six months, period of time. Mm -hmm. I said, you realize, of course, that as a consequence of this one behavior, because it's repeated so often within that two-month period of time, you're going to gain five pounds. Really? Yeah. And then I will not knock it out arithmetically. Yeah. And they go, oh, I didn't realize that. Well, now you know. Small is deadly when it comes to overeating small amounts of food consistently over time. Right? No, the, the, whole, the whole eating thing in this culture has gotten really strange, given the fact that now people don't have to take responsibility for this. All you do is take a pill. Right, and I'm thinking, about, am, I, am I losing it here? Are we, are we kidding? Right? How many kids, right, are doing things that we they shouldn't be doing, and we should be focusing on that, right? For instance, 
you're probably aware of this. We have 16.2 million kids in public high schools in this country. Every one of those kids has to show up at school at eight o'clock in the morning. Think about that, eight o'clock. What's the average time a kid who is a social media junkie is going to bed? Yeah, like What's the earliest? I'd imagine it's like 12 or one o'clock. Okay, so they have to get to school by eight, which means they probably have to get up at 6.30. So the probability is at the very least, they lose an hour, but high school kids need more, more sleep because they're growing. So they need closer to eight and a half. So essentially two hours, 14 hours over the course of a week, almost two full days. So what happens when you're sleep deprived? A variety of things, all of them catastrophic. Number one, obviously, your thinking goes awry because you're tired. Number two, emotionally, you become edgier because you're fatigued. Everybody knows that, you know, I'm sleep deprived, I'm a little bit edgy, you know, go bleep yourself, that kind of stuff. <laughs> But the thing that people don't realize that's equally important, maybe more important with the, this particular conversation, which started having to do with eating, is that your appetite gets amped up and your brain tricks you into believing you're hungry because it needs more energy. So it forces you to eat more. Think about that. So all these high school kids, day in and day out, are sleep deprived, eating more. Every one of them is going to be overweight. Most of them, by the time they get into their 30s, are going to be suffering from degenerative diseases 20 years before it typically starts. Think about that. Nobody's doing any. I think there's a nice conversation going on about it. Yes, but it's very difficult to organize school practices and parents getting their kids to school. Yeah, well, what's more important? The health of your kid or the difficulties in trying to figure out how we get him to school? At least give it to 9 o'clock. At least yeah. have that check. Disastrous. And, there's nothing, and this is a time when the weight issue has nothing to do with anything other than brain issues, not person issues. Not, I have control. No, you don't have control at that moment in time. So all these kids, when was the last time you saw this conversation written up somewhere? Yeah, I've heard people discuss it, but not around the idea of food and the consequence of food, but actually the lack of growing that you have in teenagers, because it's a growth spurt, and most of them are. It's, it's a normal circadian rhythm for the teens to actually want to go to bed at 11, 12, or 1. And you're actually now stunting their growth. And there's research, a lot of research to back this up, that you're stunting their growth. And now this is through a podcast, so I don't know how legitimate it is, but I was hearing that more rates of better sleep was coming during the COVID lockdowns when kids did not have to go to school because they could wake up later. They didn't have to worry about catching buses. And on average, they grew more. And so if you're just looking at the growth of, of their bones, and you imagine their psychology, like you talk about like how big of an impact that's going to have on their appetite, their mood, and it's when they're trying to emotionally develop, like these are all the things. And for sure, they're going to use, we already have the issue that food is a coping mechanism for adults. What are we doing to kids and, 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 for, and you know, really ingraining it in kids so that this is their instinct from the get-go? We're teaching them how to be dysfunctional and be really good at it. On every on every level. I mean, just just think about these poor kids by the time they get out of high school, and that's that's really hard to change those patterns after those years, mm -hmm. right? Especially because all of these changes occur so slowly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I remember, I went through a phase years ago where I was much, <laughs> shall we say, bigger than I am now. Mm -hmm. Okay, but this goes back into the time where all these other things didn't exist. But when my wife and I moved to California, Los Angeles, most of the time you're in a car. You're not walking around anymore. So all the calories that would typically be burned during everyday movement stop being burned. So it wasn't until an old high school friend showed up for dinner one night, somebody I hadn't seen in seven years, and the first thing out of his mouth was, man, did you gain weight? <laughs> that was a moment in time that changed me as a human being forever, right? And I began to do things that were healthy, not because they were healthy, but because I was vain and I never wanted to hear those words ever again. So I know this from that point of view, right? right. Like not knowing enough information. Who knew anything back in those? This, we're talking 1969, 1970, 71. 
Nobody knew anything back then. This whole wellness thing didn't show up until the 70s, even though the term was around since 1950. Yeah. Wellness kind of sat on the shelf for a while. Then people started talking about health as medicine began to uh, find different mechanisms and techniques for getting people healthy, like heart disease, like bypass surgery. Right. As soon as those things were in play, then everybody started talking about how do we stay healthy, right? And you think by now, given how long this has been around, right, wellness, health and wellness, that the culture has gotten continually sicker as opposed to healthier, right? right. Health and wellness has failed miserably. What's next? Well, it's it's a really tricky thing because I do kind of feel like of most of the disciplines, it's a, it's a younger discipline, as you just mentioned, like it started with training the army and then making sure you train the public to actually maybe have some reserves in the, from the army. And then literally the idea of jogging was just a, a novel thing. Then, you know, enter the bodybuilding circuit that actually created a cultural, but even then it was just for joggers and bodybuilders. That was it. And powerlifting was a very niche thing. And I do think it's really cool that I've seen the development from when I was in high school, that it was weird if you were in the gym to when I left high school, more people were training. And then after that, high school kids strength train now. And it's not weird to see people do a deadlift and into squat. Like it's evolving, but it is also been on the rise of increasingly um like just i'd say that you got a whole bunch of things here let's talk about a few major ones one is like hyper paddle foods that just are addicting as hell so that's a problem and then as you mentioned like sedentary lifestyle doesn't has, hasn't actually become better like people are aware we're more aware that like the sedentary lifestyle is an issue but our lives are getting increasingly easier like i mean with ai and robots on the, on the front door it's like we literally will have less and less responsibility and the psychology that makes us just want instant gratification so you have that all adding up over the last you know 50 60 years I, I can't improve on your description of our cultural reality right now, which on one level, I'm, I'm overstating maybe a bit, is deadly. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. is deadly. Yeah. But people are just going along with it because they're getting, you know, it's like we used to have self-esteem, mm -hmm. which was an internal feeling about self based on external interactions with one's environment. But now self-esteem has morphed into selfie-esteem. Just like we we want clicks and we want people following us because of the image that we are creating about ourselves, which for the most part has nothing to do with who we are. Things are really in a delicate transitional states right now. And the future when it comes to things like this is scary. Well, the future is what I'm really interested in health and wellness, because when you look at um more and more the knowledge is going to become solidified. And I think gradually people will accept the ideas around strength training, uh, the appropriate kind of activities and, and cardio to stay healthy. Like it'll be less debated as to what's healthy there over the course of the next 10 to 20 years. There's still going to be like some far outline uh, extremes, but people will understand exercise is necessary and it won't be hard to find the information on how to do it. Then the next thing is nutrition. And again, there is way more like, we're getting closer and closer to finding a really good idea of what good nutrition is still a lot of dichotomy or a lot of like dogmas out there. And there's still a lot of debate, but it's not far off from eating mostly whole foods, right? Like even most camps are going to be like, okay, we just, if you stay away from hyper palatable foods, it's really a lot easier to be healthy. So it comes down to that last piece, because if we know what they physically should do, then it's like, why aren't we doing it? And enter psychology. This is why I'm so fascinated with this realm because, you know, I went to school to learn how people get in shape. So I did kinesiology. I'm like, oh, it's all about food. And I did the psychology or so I did a nutrition degree. It's actually all about psychology. It's all about the ability of the person to figure out how do I do the things I'm uncomfortable with? So I'd love to dive into this. Let's what is your perspective of what people are missing when it comes to behavior change? And uh, you talked about kind of the pausing and, and that kind of stuff, but what are some other tools that people need to recognize if you're going to try to get better at eating and exercising routinely? Well, singularly, the most important thing that people need to learn is to sleep. They need to know how much sleep they need. And sometimes it's really confusing when you hear sleep as experts talk about sleep. They'll say... Yeah, you need anywhere from seven to nine hours, just like they talk about eating. Yeah, you need anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 calories. Well, is that useful for anybody? 
No, because there's the gaps are so large. Well, well, how does that fit me? What right? So you need people need a model, right? So if you're you need to know that if you're using an alarm clock to get up in the morning, you're sleep deprived. The only question is how much, right? Most of us as adults, seven and a half hours, and you get up naturally. That's the right amount of sleep for you. If you still need to sleep, you're not getting enough sleep. And anybody who thinks that you can catch up on the weekend, that's already been disproven. That does not work. You'll never be able to catch up. But that's that's the storyline that lots of people talk to themselves about. Don't worry, I'll catch up on the weekend. I'll sleep. You never catch up. So once you get sleep aligned, then you have then you're not going to get that phony hunger thing happening, right? right? So you have a little bit more control viscerally to begin with. Then information, find out, do some reading, right? And hopefully the people around you, sometimes, I mean, there are difficult circumstances for people. For instance, I've seen so many marriages where the husband is really insecure and he would much prefer his wife staying heavy because if she begins to lose weight and look good, she'll get hit on by guys out in the world. And who knows, maybe she'll not realize she doesn't want to be with me and leave me. I mean, that's not uncommon. Trust me, when, when any husband sees his wife losing a lot of weight and she's morphing into a much more attractive person, the alarm bells go off. Likewise, the same thing in reverse, but not quite as much with the same level of tension. But that's what happens. People have to commit. They have to say to themselves, okay, this is a moment in time when I have to realize I'm compromising my health. 20 years from now, I could have a serious disease, right? There has to be that moment, that epiphany, to realize just how important this is. Right. I remember for me, watching my dad, oh my goodness, my dad was the only person I ever knew who flunked bypass surgery. His arteries were so bad, he was supposed to do a quadruple bypass surgery, four arteries. They were only able to do one. In the, it, wait a minute, it gets better. In the letter that the surgeon wrote to my father's personal physician, <laughs> He, he referred to my father's arteries as having toothpaste in them. That's how, that's how clogged they were. So you would think, given that feedback, that my father would use that as, as a motivational tool to begin to shift what he was eating and be healthy. The very first time my wife and I had dinner with my dad and mom after that, what does my father order? steak and french fries. And my mom, who loves to cook, you know, she was, she was delighted with that because she can make her husband happy eating what he wants. I mean, think about that. And I'm thinking to myself, am I, did I just, am I this crazy? Is my wife had to grab my leg underneath the table and very quietly say, <laughs> just wrong with it. Yeah. So I took a deep breath and said, okay, I'm out of the loop, can't do anything. That's how ingrained stuff can be. So that from that moment on, you knew where my life was going. <laughs> I wouldn't even go to a store selling meat, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, it's super interesting you talk about that because I had someone on here who works with a lot of, he trains individuals who are, you know, dealing with very specific heart disease, but also cancer, recovering cancer uh, patients. And he said there was a very different uh, attitude towards these two people. And he said, when he was working with the people who are going through cancer treatments, they had this essence of like, I'm fighting this thing. They had an urgency. They had this aha moment that they need of like, I'm going to beat this thing. And they're just more desperate. They're more like, they're just so much more ambitious. And he said, when he worked with people who are dealing with heart disease or, you know, recovering from heart disease and, and surgery is that he said that a lot of them were just doing it to get through it. It's like to get back to their old routine. But then it's like, but your old routine, your old lifestyle is what led you this way. And so it, even my dad said this, he's like, yeah, I need that one big one to scare me into it. It's like, it probably won't <laughs> based on what I've heard is like, that even doesn't even work because it's still you changing what you need. And what you talked about is so important because anyone who's had a good transformation has had that moment in their life. And it's, it's so clear you're, you're ready to change the next day. And so when I want to help people or I, you know, someone will be like, how do you help someone that you really wish could improve? You have to encourage them to look for their epiphany. And the epiphany has to be so rooted inside you that then you, you 
will not change your mind about it. And, and it's, it's really hard to get someone to find an epiphany, to find a moment because I'll talk to some individuals and be like, yeah, I don't want to end up like my mom, but they're still not doing anything. It's still like you have the idea, but a true core rooted to your, rooted to your soul epiphany is hard to find, but you know it when it does. So that's why I say, look for it. And when it happens, don't fucking let it go because this is a long ass road and it's hard to stay changing. So it has to be rooted that deep. What would you say people need to look for in that? Well, it's, it goes back to our earlier moment, back when we were talking about the conversations in one's head. Those conversations, they're still there. And you have a lot of conversations around the eating of food and where you learned to eat this stuff. Everybody sits around, it. well, most of us learned about food early on, sitting around the dinner table with the family, because there is a, a, a presence there that supersedes the individuals. This is, this is what we do. This is what we eat. This is how much we eat. Because I remember years later how angry my mom got at me because I didn't eat any of the things she made anymore. Mm -hmm. I broke the religion. I stepped outside the church. And, she, and my mom, who was one of the sweetest women you would ever want to meet, was suddenly in a rage state because I was basically firing her as mom. But I was not going to eat what she wanted me to eat which was her typical dishes. I'd stopped eating meat already, and she couldn't. It was so difficult for her to deal with. She actually had amnesia for the last time I was there and told her these things. She said, you don't eat meat anymore? No, Ma, I told you that a year ago, the last time we were here, right? Mm -hmm. That's how ingrained it is, right? That family stuff that goes on, that imprinting. Mm -hmm. Think how many meals you had sitting around a table with your family. Right. Yeah, people forget about that, that the, the amount of reinforcement that occurs. And there's all kind of messaging going on. You learn so much about social emotional stuff, all the patterns around the dinner table, as well as the consumption of food. So it's multi-leveled and either can be really good and useful or the opposite. Yeah, problematic. I'm really well, curious about that because... So let's like kind of, because this is a narrative I've heard before when it comes around psychology of kids eating, and it's so difficult to feed kids. And I see this with my nieces and nephews where you just want them to to eat the, the healthy food. And it's like, can you at least eat a little bit? And they're just waiting for the dessert. They're just waiting for the candy, right? Because it's part of the normal routine. And that is probably one of that's, the major overarching problems true, is true. that expectation to dessert, right? Right. And, and they see other people eating it and they'll eat it at other times, other places, right? Mm -hmm. So... That's hard. But, uh, okay, so try to find things that are the healthiest there, the, the healthiest form of that particular category. Right. Uh, so in, instead of high-fat ice cream, low-fat frozen yogurt, see if that, that, that right. flies. Try, try to maneuver so that they're giving them something of what they want, but not the complete thing, yeah. because otherwise, right? That right. And, yeah, and I think this is actually as long as a person's open to the benefits of food processing, where you can have these things that are nutritious, they'll have higher protein and lower fat, and it's actually tastes a little bit better. Right. So there's like protein shakes are incredible for that. And this is like the new age that we have within food processing that it's not all negative. And as long as you're looking at whether or not a person can handle the digestion, of some of these foods, I think it's, it was really interesting. Cause I remember, uh, I, I, Appreciate it as difficult for parents when they don't have the knowledge. Uh, but even if they have the knowledge and the kid won't eat, they're just trying to get their kid to eat. And that's a really difficult thing. So I think like, I hear this all the time. It's like, oh, you know, parents made you finish your plate. Parents made you finish your plate. And I think that's a part of the psychology, but not for everyone, because it's not always the reason why people are trying to always finish their plate. I think it was more maybe food wastefulness that added to it. And I know that with my psychology and with my girlfriend where we'll talk about like, if we have leftover and it is like, you know, food on the go or something's like, you don't actually have to finish this plate, bring it home and then maybe eat it later. But it's like, you also don't need to eat it all. Right. Like it's, it's, it's not always the most necessary thing if it's not a very nutritious food or if you don't even like it that much. I mean, when I was growing up, there was this, consistently used line about that 
eat your food. Come on, there are kids starving in Africa. Right. Somehow, <laughs> as if that has any meaning whatsoever, if you stop and think about it, what is the difference? How is that going to help the kid in Africa? Yeah, yeah. That was that was woven into the fabric of the culture. Right. And, and you know, in retrospect, as you get older, you go, what in the, where in the world did that come from? No, kids know when they're hungry. Feeling full, getting used to everything we need to know about our sensory experience, we were born with eating, sleeping, and moving. The first thoughts we had in our head were the sensations in our body. Mm -hmm. right? Sensation was cognition. Slowly over time, we learn language. And while we're learning language, we're learning all this programming that is coming along with it so that we begin to build a model of reality that is not based on sensory experience anymore, but rather what we're learning social, emotionally, in order to please our parents so they don't get angry at us. Yeah. Not a good idea, right? As is obvious, let the kid know when to stop eating. Yeah, That's I think he already knows or she knows already. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's something you almost have to trust the kid over time. And and again, every kid is different. And I haven't had a kid, but that's the one policy I think would make sense is they're going to have some satiety signals. They're going to have some instincts around their foods and food preferences and to allow guiding them to, you give them the best options they can. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's too, as, as long as you're also not putting hyper palatable foods as the main option, then we're giving them a better chance of recognizing their intuitions. Like, Hey, you know, I don't want to eat this, I was like, can I eat something else? Well, I can give you some fruit. <laughs> you know, it doesn't always have to be the next thing, the dessert. And if they're still not wanting to eat that, it's like, you're not really hungry if you're not willing to eat fruit, right? Like that's, that's even an adult test. If an adult is like, I gotta, I think I'm hungry right now. Okay. Are you willing to eat any vegetables or fruit right now? No, it's, a, it's craving. Like it's, it's not really truly hunger. Back to the pause. Yeah. Pause a little bit. Think about, and that's, a, it's, that's a tool that I've been using for myself and my clients is just pause. If you think it's hunger, would you eat vegetables or fruit right now? And if you're saying no to those two things and you've had a decent amount of food today, then that is just a craving and we can pause, we can reframe it. You can think about what's making, because often it's even just some sort of a stress that's leaving you there, or maybe it's boredom, whatever it might be, but you can now rewire your brain for a new option. I'm really curious because this was uh, some of the work that you're into right now. Mm -hmm. I want you to kind of go into detail of what the lifestyle intelligence is all about. Okay. It really begins with um, the work done by John Mayer, Peter Salovey, and made famous by Dan Goldman with his book, Emotional Intelligence. Because back in the, in the early 90s, when the, the first two guys did research, and then Dan Goldman read the research and wrote, and wrote the book, Emotional Intelligence, he introduced the idea, or they introduced the idea that we have more than one intelligence. We have intellect and we have our emotional life, right? So they legitimize the idea of there's more than one intelligence. So a couple of years back, I was thinking, well, I, I forget what I was doing and the idea popped into my head. Wait a minute. Why can't lifestyle be considered an intelligence as well? Lifestyle intelligence, LQ, our primary, our first intelligence, the one we were born with. And then I began to think about, well, how would I do this? What would I do in order to make this into something that would be useful for people? So I started writing short, few-minute script kinds of things. And I did enough of them to say, okay, but this isn't enough. I need something in addition to the idea of me showing up for three minutes a day and giving you a really important bit of information that I want you to think about for the rest of the day. And it will be something to do with eating, sleeping, and moving, and whatever else is impacted as a consequence. So what, did I, what I needed was to make this a more interesting and more useful and complete program was I had developed a series of audio programs a while back using a storytelling form of hypnotic technology. I told you, I tell you, adult fairy tales. The concept is called hypnoperipheral processing, and basically it is structured in the following manner. I start off with a story, a myth of the hero, Joseph Campbell kind of theme. That goes for a few minutes, as there's a setup about a person with a problem, goes out in the world, 
and then meets a magical character or an interesting or, or unusual set of circumstances. And then that story pauses and two completely different stories start up simultaneously, a different story in each ear. This is built on the hypnotic idea of the dual induction, two hypnotists talking simultaneously to one subject. I saw this in a workshop once and I said, wow, what a great idea. And then I looked around and nobody had ever put it on audio. I said, I've got to figure out a way to do this. So I spent a whole bunch of time coming up with storylines and then eventually everything came together and now I have a whole bunch of programs. So this is a way of, it's a profound, oh, let me back up. There's a state in between waking and sleep called the hypnagogic state. It is profound. Everybody, every so often you get this sense of, I'm not quite awake, I'm not quite asleep, that in-between state, but it occurs very quickly. But this audio technology has the ability to keep you in that space. It turns out that space is enormously creative and you can process information without your conscious mind having a clue. So I constructed all these positive suggestions for change woven into the fabric of the stories, which most of the time people say, yeah, I heard. I heard some of those suggestions. I said, how many did you hear? They'd say, I don't know, four or five. Okay, there was about 30 of them in, in every program, right? So I know with that, what I get is the opportunity to help you manage stress better, to help motivate you to do the stuff that you're hearing in those three minute straightforward segments that are the headline app in the Lifestyle Intelligence app. I think it's a pretty good thing, but like I said, like anything else, you never know whether how somebody's gonna to respond to it, but I, I think it's useful and uh, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about it. Super fascinating because I do find like hypnosis has so much potential. Um, I, Going a little deeper on that is, for, well, how, how have you seen it work for people? I'd love to know how this uh, this form of hypnotherapy has been working for people. What are some of the results you've seen? Well, people, I mean, I don't, I don't know all the people. I mean, I know some some of the people like in my practice who are right. using them, and they give, they give me feedback, and they say, you know, this is really useful for me. I really look forward to listening to that three minutes every day. And the audio material, if people, in this culture, a half hour is a long amount, a long amount of time. Can you find a half hour to do this? If you do, you'll you'll begin to notice, wow, this is this is worthwhile. So the people who take the time benefit in some way, shape, or form. It might not be what they thought they were going to be doing at first. Sometimes it's just, wow, these things made me feel more assertive. Or overall, I was just feeling more relaxed. Or my relationship improved. There's a whole bunch of different possibilities because there's so many different topics being talked about in, in the catalog. Mm -hmm. But uh Given from the feedback I've gotten from people and the, and other people sending me messages like, wow, we really enjoy your programs, keep doing more of them. So it doesn't work for everybody, but nothing does. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. no, that's, that's for sure. It's really interesting. So, because hypnosis, if I understand it, what we're trying to do more so is to become in contact to a level with the subconscious mind, to be able to hit the emotional state when you're really like your guards down, essentially you're vulnerable. And from my understanding over the years of talking with other psychologists and psycho uh, therapists, is like the subconscious mind's way more of the driver. It's like the elephant and the rider. Like the subconscious mind's the elephant and the rider is the logical brain that's trying to rationalize things, but you're kind of steering it. But if the elephant makes a decision, you can't fucking move that boat. And when you're looking in this, like you mentioned that sleep, wake, and even just what happens during your REM cycle, like that's when you're taking care of your emotional processing, right? That's when your mind is actually trying to understand mm -hmm. and comprehend. If you don't get REM sleep, it's actually not healthy for your recovery of your emotional state. And you're kind of taking it and you mentioned creativity. Well, that's where your mind's exploring the most random things. Right. So I think that's really cool. Um, do you use hypnosis routinely in your therapy outside yes. of just using this? Absolutely. I love the indirect suggestion. I don't tell people what to do. I just tell them that there's a part of them that knows what to do. Right. And that part's going to take over at the right time in the right place and with the right people. Right. See, because if you go directly at some things, the part that's still resistant 
is a little bit too, has too much leverage at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you can get people into a state where they're not paying any attention, and I can see that. And then sometimes you can say you can go to more directly at things, but not everybody enters that level of depth where they're in some way, shape, or form in that tweener state between waking and sleep. Which is, when I can get people in there sometimes, but not always. So when I don't, I'm, I'm careful how I phrase things so everybody is respected in the appropriate way. But it's useful. It's a, it's, and it also, people need to relax <laughs> a lot more because they don't know. Most people are so stressed out, they don't even know they're stressed out. They don't know that it's not normal to be that yeah, stressed out. You get out. so used to it. Totally. Right? That when you actually get relaxed, you go, oh, my God, I didn't know I was I, that, that sort of thing. And, and, you know, some people who inherently you might think, uh, I, I've seen this in certain body types and they're high stress people, like it does affect your body composition. And like some people where they're just so, they don't realize they're wound up before bed. They don't realize that that's affecting their sleep. And even if they get the, you know, the seven, maybe whatever they need. Uh, I also want to highlight that. I got to come back to this quick. I love how you said that because I never thought of this. 2,000, 3,000 calories is a very big difference for someone. It's 50%. And and then uh, in seven to nine hours, that's that, that makes sense. Like, why aren't we measuring this? Once you give somebody that 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 piece of information, so it's between two and three thousand calories. That gives a person a license to eat three thousand calories <laughs> because that seriously. And people yeah. are always looking for the. Oh, I can rationalize it. They told me between two and three thousand. One thing we know for sure, and please excuse my language, people are great at bullshitting themselves. Yeah. So give them something that they can use, they'll use it. Totally. And, and not to like that's it's a measurement that we know has an effect on an individual based on their metabolism. So it only makes sense that you would try to start to measure the sleep and the effect of the sleep. And if you're not getting that good quality sleep because you're high stressed, and you know having conversations with people more recently, I'm like, are you doing anything at the end of your day to stop thinking about your day, like to to come compartmentalize what you're going through because you have a business, you got all this stuff. And then if you bring that to the bed sheets, well, like I actually had a client who was, he said he was getting like four to five hours of sleep, but he was in bed for seven. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, Oh, I'm just thinking a lot. I'm like, okay, it's not your job to think when you're in bed. Like that's actually the worst thing. So I got on into some meditation. I got him to start thinking of breathing and started to calm down. It's like, oh, wow, I got a lot more sleep. And it's like, yes, yeah, like oh. and I, the, the best sentiment I heard was from my friend. He's like, it's your job to sleep in bed. You want to, you want, you care about your job. You care about these things. That's great. But it's not your job to do that right now because you won't do it very effectively, Jamal. You, it, that's you, that you pause might. you need. What that, that particular change that you got this guy out of what he was doing into something useful, conceivably down the might have saved his life or prevented dementia. Because the one thing we know for sure, if you don't get enough sleep, your your brain clogs up. The cleaning process it takes place at night while you're asleep. And if you don't let your brain take out at the garbage, right? What happens? Garbage accumulates. And when I first heard that, I thought it was going to go viral in 2017. Most important piece of information I'd ever heard. <laughs> Right? Did it? No. Yeah. Rarely does anybody ever know that piece of information. Is there anything more important than that? Sleep takes up one third of your life. If you don't do this, your brain clogs up with gum, and you probably are going to suffer from Alzheimer's or something similar to that. Does it, could, could there be anything more motivational than that? No. Uh, and well, I think the, the downside with the health industry is that we end up looking. We we want to look at like immediate benefits way more. We're instant gratification, right? So you could talk about Alzheimer's, dementia. You could talk about obesity, diabetes, any of these things, and that that they could be a slow drip. And especially when you talk about heart disease and anything is like the difference between you living maybe 100 to 90, or you might live 70 to 80. That actually doesn't make someone in their 20s or 30s fearful enough. It really doesn't. And I always tell people, I'm like, okay, let's say you had one behavior that you really like doing. Maybe it's playing video games late at night and it keeps you up a little later. So you don't get as much sleep. You really like this video game. I totally get that. But we have a machine that tells you you're not going to live to 90 because of it. You're going to live to 80. Are you going to stop? Most people wouldn't. Most people are like maybe a bit, but like 10 years and I'm, I'm this young. It's, it's not on my front door. Right. But then I said, okay, well, you're not going to get to see your grandkid you know, graduate and they really wanted you there. And you're not going to see the birth of the other grandkid. You start to actually name the individual things that are actually going to be on your front door when you're in your nineties, then that kind of pulls at your heartstrings and people need to start to think about even just the present state, not just the dimension, all that stuff, bring it to the present moment. And it's just, 
when you, this is my favorite one that you'd already mentioned your emotional state, your emotional state when you don't sleep is worse. And the, one of the biggest ones that I heard from Matt Walker's book, which I imagine you've read is that your ability to recognize other people's facial expressions is worse. So you're in a bad mood and you can't recognize anyone else's mood. Then your whole day is going to be worse because it's just obviously this going to negative feedback loop. And then the worst thing is at the end of the day, you're like, Oh man, that was such a hard day. I deserve me time. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, I, Totally understand entertainment, some unwinding time. Your whole fucking day is you time. So take responsibility for the, the sleep time. So your whole day of you time, because it's your experience, is useful. And then just like, it's okay to negotiate a little 10% of your day, not 20 to 30. That's going to leak into it. And as you mentioned, if you're not waking up naturally, and it's really hard to get up. It happens before midnight, not after midnight. Very few people can control the time that they have to wake up for, to go to work. Start controlling the time you go down. Nothing can be more important. Yeah. No, I All love right. it. Well, this, this, this is great. Uh, one last question, because sure. I know we take up your hour. What's your most recent ambition? What are you really excited to come down the pipeline? Well, I'd like to, um, to get well, one of the things that, that I've been doing is um, writing for Psychology Today specifically about these issues that you and I have been talking about. So I'm hoping I can get a little bit of visibility and hopefully um, I can build on the, the little bit that's been happening with the app. That's where I want to spend my future is, is helping to change the trajectory of, of, of the way the culture is going. Be one of the people who are doing something useful. I love that. Well, why don't you tell where people can find out more about you? Uh, LifestyleIntelligenceLQ.com or, or one word. All small letters, lifestyleintelligencelq.com. You'll see me. I'll give you a brief description of what's in the thing. And if you're interested in it, you get a couple of weeks free if you want to test it out and see whether it's useful for you. That would be wonderful. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your info. This is a great conversation. Thank, thank you. This was wonderful as well. Thank you again to Dr. Lloyd Glauberman. I really had a lot of fun in that conversation. The hour flew by. I often really get captivated by any conversation with someone who's a specialist in the realm of psychology as i'm so fascinated with it is this is the biggest problem that people have as i mentioned on the show a lot of us will know the information but we're not executing it we're not taking the actions we need to you you need to have this epiphany this moment that he had with his father to realize i can't be that person and you're going to feel it's so rooted in your core that you can't let it go like any discomfort that you have within this behavior change that you're going to take you accept, if you just accept, it's going to be hard because that epiphany was so integral and it was so ingrained in you that you just, you have to change. And commonly it is a painful state or a painful mindset that will get people to move more. So it becomes so important that people are able to realize maybe there's something that you don't want to be in a pain state or you're in a pain state. So if you're having a hard time with your own motivation and mindset, you got to search for your epiphany. You got to search for your painful moment that it's like, I'm just not allowing this anymore. Any discomfort around behavior change is way better to deal with than dealing with this result. And that is possibly one of the major things that will help you to see this long-term. It's always hard for people. I help so many people and the people who actually have the best effect are the people who have had this moment really burnt into them so that they will commit and they'll do it long-term because it's a hard battle. I think there was some really good thoughts here too, because you can use a lot of what you talked about, where you talked about the story we're telling ourselves. This is super important. How something happens to you will, and how you discuss that in your head is super important for how you're going to behave, right? You had a rough day. Um, you didn't get sleep, anything like that. And then all of a sudden that's a justification for, Hey, now I got to eat more. Maybe you can flip that story, right? It's like, I didn't get good sleep. I didn't have time to train today, but I can at least eat well. And even if it's not necessarily the perfect amount of calories, and you say, I can at least have whole foods. If I do that one thing, I'll feel like today was a win. And that's how you flip your narrative in your head. It's the story you're going to tell yourself that's super important for your actions, right? And as I talked about the rider and the horse, your subconscious mind underneath it all is probably driving this force but you can start to communicate with it with Lloyd's tool, the pause. And I've always talked about my, uh, you know, being mindful with food and all these things. 
but I really appreciate the word pause. And I'm certain I've heard it before, but it, it hit me a little bit more today to just give you that tool. And I'm going to be giving my clients more pause more. And I've used it in the past for sure. When I used to binge eat, when I was in the middle of a binge, I would at least try to be present. But if I could give myself the opportunity to pause, like let's just stop eating for like a minute, maybe five minutes, see how you feel. And then it might sit with you. Oh man, that's actually a lot of food. I'm actually, you know, okay, not eating. I, I, I don't really guess I need to keep eating. And as I use the other tools I mentioned, if you're not willing to eat fruits and vegetables uh, or even just some meats, then it can at least tell you, okay, this is purely a craving and I'm eating emotionally. And as Lloyd said, maybe go for a walk, maybe fill that need that you have for something else. And I've had this effect in the past that if normally my instinct is to do something for me, it was smoke weed and eat, and I was he heavily stressed, but I gave myself the opportunity to pause, sit with the emotion, and I went for a walk. I came back and I felt better about that emotion. I still felt stressed, but I felt better. And then at the end of the day, I the craving for you know smoking weed and eating disappeared. And I just felt way more in control of that moment. So when you have these instincts around, I want to eat this, or I want to do this, or I want to be lazy, just pause and question it and give yourself an opportunity for a new action that's going to help program or, or communicate with your subconscious level of thinking to help you create a new habit. I want to highlight a couple of other things. The value of sleep is so integral. It can't get overstated because it's the, the easiest thing that we can try to uh, kind of overlap. I still have been doing it a little bit, but I'm better than most people, but I'm still not great. And what he had said really hit me and not just the alarm clock thing. That's a part of it, but it was the idea of someone telling you 2000 to 3000 calories and seven to nine hours of sleep. Those are very different, but, but it's real. Like those are measurable things that apply to a person. A certain amount of calories will give you a result. A certain amount of sleep will give you a result. And as you mentioned, a simple tool is like, if you have to use the alarm clock, when you wake up, maybe you're not going to sleep early. As I mentioned, it's a sleep before midnight. That's going to help you get to that state. I do think it's really interesting when it comes to the research around youth and their development. I think that's, I, I couldn't agree more. It's such a complicated thing when it comes to the system on a global scale, on a, on a national scale, when you, you're trying to change the school system, I would love to see it be an opportunity. I could go on a rabbit hole on this, but I'll quickly say it as a tangent is knowing people who work night or who work shift work, who have to do two nights on two days on, and then they take time off, uh, firefighters, you know, I, I work with a nurse and like, you're literally making what's integral to our health and wellness, the firefighters, the police, the nurses, the doctors to be sleep deprived. You're making their sleeping pattern the worst. And it just doesn't make sense because we need those people to perform at their best. Even if you did night shifts for a month and you did day shifts for a month. And I was even talking to my client. She said, some people just prefer nights. They should have that choice, but we have a broken system. So you manage what you can. But if you are not on night shifts, if you don't have to deal with this, take the responsibility and opportunity you had, as I mentioned, how much it's going to affect your whole day and all of your decision-making that goes with it. As Ian mentioned, your body's going to make you think you need more food. You, there's, you don't need more food. You don't burn more calories. It just helps you feel better in the state of being fatigued. So really try to apply yourself to more of the sleep as being a priority, not just a suggestion. And experiment with it. As you mentioned, that seven to nine hours, it's something I'm going to try to lean into myself is where is my sweet zone? I've usually found seven and a half is pretty good for myself. But again, it has to be earlier rather than later. And so I hope you learned a lot from this episode. I think there's a lot to offer when it comes to some practical tools. Don't hesitate if you're interested in some of his hypnosis that you can check out his website as he has some great information there uh, because it could be something that helps you get in touch with that subconscious level of thinking that gradually over time you get the kind of change that you want in your behavior. So don't hesitate, hesitate to go check out his website. And thank you as a listener. I always appreciate you checking these out. Please share, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And if you can share this, this helps me reach more people if you think it would be helpful for someone. And uh, if you can leave a review, it always helps me grow this little podcast. So 
thank you again as a listener, because I appreciate you taking your time and learning from what I'm trying to offer out there because I'm trying to help you on your own pursuit because life is not about the pursuit of happiness, but rather the happiness within your pursuit. And I'll get you next time.